social scientist and sociologist, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the general practices in terms of doing social science research. Um, but I also want to sort of start with, and then I'm sorry, and then I'll go into talking a bit about software carpentry as well as a kind of case study of some research that I've done. Um, what I want to start with, though, is that this is hard. <laughs> this is not an easy task to figure out. Um, what are the outcomes? It's not an easy thing to come up with uh, with a solution to the problem of, of how to how to measure the impact of a workshop. Um, so I'll start with that and also say that I don't have all the answers. So I'll give you what I can um, with caveats that uh, it may or may not work for you and we'll, we'll probably have a lot to talk about in terms of your expertise as well. Um, so I'm going to start with this concept from social science called commensuration. <coughs> Um, commensuration uh, is an idea of the transformation of ideals or qualities into a number or a metric. Um, and I'm, I'm using this definition from Esplin and Stevens, which is a pretty um, well-known article in the social scientist, sciences about commensuration. And this sounds like a fairly simple task, but it, what, what they're saying in this article is that it's crucial to how we categorize and make sense of the world to know how we do this task. Um, and so essentially, this, this ability to change something from qualitative into something quantitative um, gives us a, a, an understanding of, of the social, is, is a part of our social fabric. So when we look at why we actually commensurate, the question is, uh, is it a way to reduce and simplify disparate information into numbers that can be easily compared? So in other words, a way to take something that's complicated and make it more simple. Um, allows people to quickly grasp, represent, and compare the differences. So it's a, it's a way of making a comparison possible, right? A standardization, right? So a way of constructing proxies for uncertain and, and elusive qualities. Condensing and reducing the amount of information that people have to process, which is useful for representing value and simplifying decision making. And I think the crux of the argument that this article says, um, and again, this was <coughs> at the end of the 90s, so I would suggest that this, is, uh, that this has changed, but they say that the complexity of decisions has propelled the spread of commensuration and decision making. So as we get more complicated, commensuration becomes more important because we, we are conveying that much more information through the, the, um, the data that we're creating. But the other part of this that I think is key is that commensuration is fundamentally relative, meaning that it is a social act. This is something that we do in, in a social setting. Boiling down this information in discrete ways so that it's easier to digest and understand is a way to try to understand more difficult things and to understand the process of doing that. As we do this, we determine their value as well. So it must be thought through in terms of the setting within which it was created. In other words, we construct this kind of sense of commensuration. Another way to think of it is in terms of sorting, right? So commensuration sorts and allows us to parse what is important and what is less important. What are the things that we want out of our workshops to convey that's important to us? And what are the things that we maybe don't find as important? The act of doing this commensuration is what has us defining what are the important things that we want to talk about. So the crux of all of this for, for me as a social scientist is to bring this question of social science to you and to say, we are fish in a fishbowl, like fish in a fishbowl, we are trying to study the water, right? And as we are in the social settings that we're in, we're trying to study the things that we are a part of. And that's one of the challenges that social scientists face is that we are studying what we are in. Um, and, and that means that we have to understand that there's going to be social biases based on what we, based on where we are. Or as Neil deGrasse Tyson puts it, uh, American scientist, in science when human behavior enters the equation, things go nonlinear. That's why physics is easy and sociology is hard. <laughs> Because what happens is that we're trying to study the things while we're also in the things. Um, we're trying to study a situation that we're a part of. Um, okay, so this is not going to be that surprising to you, right? This is, um, uh, this is a fairly basic uh, description of the di difference between qualitative and quantitative research, right? So qualitative, inductive, the data is typically textual. Quantitative research is deductive. Typically, that's numerical. These are methods that we've heard of probably for, on both sides, qualitative research, interviews, focus groups, observational studies, field research, quantitative
data, the survey, survey research, and longitudinal studies, polling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I want to just convey here is that there is this is this is how we get data, and this is often the way we split apart the way we think about getting data. But I want to kind of problematize this just a little bit with this idea of commensuration as well, especially commensuration as a social process. So let's take a very simple question that you might ask about a workshop that you do. Um, this I drew directly from a study of um, the software carpentry. How satisfied were you with the course content of the workshop that you attended? Okay, simple question, right? We might all want to know this. Satisfaction seems like something that's a fairly easy thing to understand. So in this case, the answer or the data that we would collect is on a scalar, right, one to 10. This is a very specific act of asking somebody to give you a commensuration, right? To commensurate <coughs> for you, right? To create a number for you. You can go between unsatisfied and satisfied, and we could come up with something else too, right? Unsatisfied, neutral, satisfied, or very satisfied, right? So this would be same question, slightly different places that we'd ask people to put them, themselves into. Um, this is called the Likert scale. I'm sure you've seen them before. This is this is another way to look at that same question. And the third way to look at that question is just to ask them to respond, right? To give us words that, that are interesting to them. Now, why am I talking about all of these? Well, because the data that we get out of each of these is different, and the use of that data is something that we might want to question, right? So this is made up data, don't worry about it too much. There's, I just threw a bunch of things in there. But the idea behind this is that what would come out of this scalar information is that we would get numbers that we could turn, in turn use for a variety of different things. So we could get a mean of, or an average of the different uh, numbers. We could say we got a 7.3 this time, and we have a 7.2 next time, and so we have to change our, our behavior. We could also compare it, um, and this is very clear in terms of the commensuration work, we, right? We can compare that to previous times, future times. We can compare men versus women, categorical differences, right? So the numbers give us an awful lot of options here to be able to do this, this commensurative task. I love, I love talking about like, Likert scales in particular because they're such a great example of the clash between qualitative and quantitative, right? Because what often happens with these is we don't know what to do with the data once we have it. We don't know what to, where to go with Likert scales, right? We say, well, we've got them, and then we, <laughs> what often happens, and social scientists do this too, we, we, we say satisfied is all we care about, right? So we'll smush those two in a, into a category, and we'll have satisfied and everybody else, right? But what's interesting about this, I'll, and then, or then the other way to do this is to, to decide that very unsatisfied is one, unsatisfied is two, neutral is three, right? So in other words, we then commensurate the data on top of it, add some numbers in there, and try and turn it into something that we can use, right? In, in, in the, similar to the scalar category. What I love about this also though, from, from my perspective, if you're really looking at the answers that people are choosing here, who's to say that between very unsatisfied and unsatisfied, one is the correct dimension, right? Maybe it's two, maybe it's three, who knows? And what about neutral? Is that the same? Is that is that is that where does it fit into the into the category? So our categorical vari variable is always going to be linear or, or scalar, right? Um, just as my own little thing that I get into, I kind of like stacked bar graphs. If you do use Likert scales, just to say for data visualization purposes, because it's a good way of talking about over time. You can center on the mean or something like that. You can you can see this kind of relationship a lot easier. Um, this is just my. Um, but, but I also think that, that but it's a challenge, right, that we have, which is that we, we gather this data and we don't always know what to do with it or how to use it in terms of the things that we might want to convey. Okay, that's my side point. So then the third way, right, which, which is to ask people to give us um, written words. Well, the challenge with this kind of thing is that then what do you do with the written words, right? You have to analyze them, maybe you use them, perhaps they're really beneficial for you in certain ways, but how do you, how do you put them together? What do you do with them? The thing about this, though, that I would say is that when you do this kind of uh, thing, you often find information that you didn't know before. Maybe that wasn't even in the question that you asked, right? We didn't need the afternoon session. I didn't ask about the afternoon session, and yet I have information here and data that's going to be beneficial or useful for me. So how do we use these different, this is the same question, right, but with different answers. So how do we use the, the different ways of getting data to give us the answers that we actually 
answers that you're looking for instead of throwing everything in the kitchen sink and hoping that we can get something that, that works. Let's think through these kinds of things. So um, again, I'm a mixed methods researcher and I believe that you need to do whatever, use whatever method that you can. Some methods are um, better suited for some things than others, so we need to think through those things first. So my question is to start with, well, what is it that we want to know? What is the information that we're trying to look for? What is the thing that we find most important to try and understand? And if we don't know that, which is possible, then maybe we need to do turn to qualitative research to figure out that answer. So start asking people, what is it that's the most important about this workshop? What are the things that we most need to, to, to do to be able to um, get funding, right? Um, the second then is how are we going to use this data? And the reason I say that is because often there's some sort of, um, there, there's an outcome that we're looking for. So if we're looking to try and use this data to create a chart, then there's a certain set of things we should ask, or in certain ways we should look at the, the information. Do you want to tweet it, right? I'll actually talk about this. Um, the, the research I did, one of the things he said was, well, it'd be nice if we got some tweetable quotes, right? That may sound strange, but for if we're trying to come up with information that's actually useful for what we're trying then, then that's important. Do you want a map? Do you, do you need to create some sort of coordinates, that kind of data that you want? Um, do you want to measure it over time? And if you do, do you want to have a, a graph that will, ever, will change over time? In which case, we want to create something that we're going to be able to ask several times in a row. Um, do you want to categorize it? Do you want categories over time? Um, do you want to know what you don't know? Then, in which case, do an open-ended question. So I guess my point here is just simply that data should serve your needs. Right? We should gather what we need in terms of the data, and we should use it to serve the needs that we have um, to be able to make those cases. Okay, so we've got an idea of what data looks like, but we're still here in this case where we're the fish in the fishbowl, and we, we know that we've got some water and we, just, we still need to figure it out. Well, the, the challenge here is to control for bias, and I know we've talked about that in, before. One of the things that I come as a social scientist slightly differently is that I, I, I believe bias exists and I am not afraid of it. And, and I encourage you to not be afraid of it either, right? Bias exists in almost everything that we do because we are those fish in the fishbowl. So we have to acknowledge it, get friendly with it, and start talking to the bias a little bit more so that we can have a relationship with it instead of saying that it's something that we don't want to talk about. Um, so uh, in order to do that, we have to, we, in order to control for bias, we have to know what it is that, that, that the bias is, right? So I'm going to talk about a few different types. Um, these are probably, these are, these are not all the different ways the bias can, can come into your research, but I, I'll, I'll walk through these and then talk briefly about how you might consider doing um, controlling for them. Some of them are easier to control for than others, as I'm sure you, you well know, um, but I'll talk through a little bit of that. These, I think, are some of the biggies. So the first is confirmation bias. This is, of course, the tendency to reaffirm your own values and beliefs and to create research methods that confirm what you already believe to be true, right? Um, so I want evidence that my workshops are fantastic, so I will set up a whole bunch of questions that tell me that my workshops are wonderful, right? Um, the challenge with this, of course, is that you aren't going to learn anything <laughs> if you keep setting up the questions that way. And also, you're going to get research that comes back that isn't necessarily going to tell you what the, what the other side is, okay? So to counter this, um, what I suggest doing is doing a, um, a kind of a, um, an experiment with yourself when you, when you come up with a question and when you look at the data that you're gathering. Looking at that question and the data and you say to yourself, is it possible for me to have a completely opposite opinion and answer this question, right? Is it possible for me to, and think of maybe two or three different ways where you, 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 you imagine yourself, I believe that this question, the answer is probably going to be, I don't know, maybe 23% are going to say it's excellent, um, to another 30% are going to say it's okay, and then there's going to be whatever the rest of them are going to be say it's not great. Imagine for yourself, what if those, those were completely different? Is it still possible for people to are you still able to get the kind of results that you want? Um, it's a little easier to look in, in terms of qualitative research, too. You can say, um, you know, tell me the things about this. This is a leading question, which we'll talk about later. But tell me the things that you really, uh, tell me all of the things that you loved about this workshop, right? Well, that's assuming that there's, that, 
they loved something about the workshop, right? Um, and we might want to make that assumption, but the question is, if they didn't love anything about that workshop, are they able to answer that question, right? Are we comfortable with that assumption as something that we're starting with? And we might be, but we might not be, right? So what are the assumptions that you're starting with, and how is it that you can, can look at what it is that you think you might want to confirm and flip it completely to the opposite so that you can see it, test the question to make sure that it, that it can be answered in a, in a different way. Okay, so sampling bias. This is when the sample that you're drawing from is not representative of the larger population that you're trying to, to um, talk to. Um, I will tell you this is almost always true in social science research, right? Because we almost never get the full population. It's just, that's just the reality. Um, the, I guess the, the, the one counter to that would be that if you were looking at everybody in a workshop and required that they filled out the form, then you would have the total population, right? But you wouldn't necessarily have the population of people outside of it. Yes? Quick question about yes. uh, in social sciences, are political biases a problem? Is it like something left wing, mm -hmm. right wing, centre, and so on? In terms of. Is that a problem? Is it a problem in general? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is it kind of confirmation for something that they mm. Absolutely. So it could be a problem. It can be a problem. So political affiliation could be a challenge um, in all parts of the social science research. So it could be a challenge in uh, in the person who's who's trying to confirm something, right? Confirmation bias certainly could be there. You could also have political affiliation would be a challenge in terms of. So in, in the U.S., I can tell you that um, there are there's different language. We'll talk about this a little bit too. There's different language that uh, often is used by different parties. I'm sure that's true elsewhere in the world as well. And the language can be um, can bias a survey towards a certain population versus another. So could, <coughs> could this person who's conducting the research? Uh, <coughs> Um, I, 
would say that countering this is about hiring interviewers who are practiced at it, but that said, I will also say this is also a part of it. Um, some studies correct for this kind of thing also by using one interviewer so that the that, that it's there is a bias, but it but it is controlled given that there's only one person who's doing the interviewer interview, but obviously larger studies can't do that. So uh, those are those are the ways to consider that. Social desirability bias. Um, this is absolutely something that you face in, in trying to understand um, uh, what happens. I would say in particular you face it in terms of uh, pre and post surveys. If you are asking in a pre-survey, um, do you know how to do X, Y, and Z? People want to tell you that they do know how to do that, right? Um, because they want to give you the information that you want. They want you to, to, to they want to answer the question behind the question. Right? They want you to be happy with them. Um, for instance, in the United States, it's very difficult to get actual data on church attendance. Uh, the reason why that is the case is because most folks will respond to you with, um, if you say to them, did you go to church last weekend? They will say yes, even if they did not go to church last weekend, because they're trying to answer another question, which is, are you a religious person? Right? Um, and this is well documented in the, in the, in the literature. So, this is challenging. To counter this, what you need to do is emphasize honesty, promise that the answers are confidential if that's appropriate, um, but I would also say that um, making it clear, especially in pre and post research, uh, or pre and post surveys, that you make it clear to folks that it's okay if they don't know something, that we will be teaching them these things, um, using some language that kind of conveys that. Um, and then finally, the Hawthorne effect, which is the, um, this and the finding um, was that when people are watched and listened to, they behave differently. Um, this should not be surprising, <laughs> but, uh, but it, is, it is quite a robust finding and we find it over and over again. So a good example of this would be that if I did a uh, set of, um, if I did a whole bunch of interviews for, say, the Software Carpentry Foundation, um, one finding could be that a lot of the folks who I talk with feel better about the organization because I've talked with them and listened, listened to them for half an hour, right? And so you might say, well, that's, that's, that's okay, right? We, we're fine with them liking software carpentry because it's great. Um, but it would also include a bias, right? It would, it would then mean that they were more predisposed towards that. So um, the, the, the point here is not that you can really necessarily correct for this, but that simply the act of going in and trying to do research is actually going to change the way people are, so that's what we do. Okay, um, so I'm gonna focus specifically just for a brief moment on survey questions and talk about fallacies and survey questions in particular since I know that's a lot of what we're focused on here. And then I'll find, uh, finish with a discussion of the, the research project that I did for the Software Carpentry Foundation. Um, and I do hope that if you have questions, please do keep them. I'm happy to answer them and talk more about this as we go. Um, so, the first is double-barreled questions, um, and I'm actually going to walk through this with some examples. Double-barreled questions, um, and again, this is focused mostly on research, but you could, or, uh, survey research, but you could also use this in thinking of interviews or, or other settings as well. Um, same fallacies would apply. So, double-barreled questions are like this. Would you prefer if this workshop were offered on Tuesdays, Thursdays for two hours, or Fridays for two hours, or do you not care which day it is offered, but only that it is offered? Meaning that it's very confusing. There's about three questions being asked in there, right, at the same time. Um, Double-barreled means you're just, it's confusing to answer, right? There's too many things going on in there. Um, we do this a lot, I will tell you. I've absolutely been guilty of doing double-barreled questions. Part of the reason why we do it as researchers is because we are so excited about getting information. We really want to have the data, um, and we want to pack as much into the questions as we can. The problem is, there's no way to answer that. It's, it's just a very confusing and complicated question. So we have to really work to parse out what it is that we're trying to get at and to look at the data itself, how we would collect the data and what we would do with that data. So making sure that the question, <coughs> the data that we get out of the question are gonna be something that's useful to us. Um, I harp on this a lot, guys, but this is, this is one of the things, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people do surveys and then come out with a huge data set and then do nothing with the data set, right? Because they don't know what to do. They haven't thought through how you might do a cross tab or what you might do with something. 
And that, that to me is important, right? We should collect data that's going to be use, useful and, and usable for folks. Okay. A leading question, I talked about this briefly. A lot of people from your company have expressed an interest in workshops. How interested are you in signing up for a workshop, right? I'm, I'm, I'm playing with this a little bit, but it's not that. What, what this is saying is, is essentially you should be interested or very interested if you want to be a part of this. And this is also working off of the social desirability bias, right? Um, we do this. We, we absolutely do create leading questions. So we need to question ourselves when we're creating questions. Is this a leading question? Um, is this something that's going to, to preference one answer over another? Overly complex. Um, I'm not even going to read this. The whole point of this is just that it's very complicated and that it doesn't really, it does, it's, it's, it's really asking a lot of things or it's maybe asking a three-part question that can't really be answered in a short period, right? One of the things to consider when doing some research, uh, one, one way of doing survey research is to do vignettes or short <coughs> stories, but even those, if you use a short story, should be somewhat clear, straightforward. Um, what you're trying to do in those is to is to convey something. So complex questions, people will just not answer it or they'll just fill out something just to get through the question. Um, that, that's just what happens. Um, word choice. Now, this is where I get into a discussion a little bit of your population. Depending on the population that you're surveying, there may be words or specific choices of words that you want to use or don't want to um, and one of the challenges as researchers is that, is that it's important for us to get ourselves in the mindset of the person who's taking the, the survey in order to make sure that the, the questions that we're asking make sense to them. Um, does the meaning of the word translate, right? Do they, do they understand what that means? And that's also why I would suggest pre-testing is one of the best ways to figure that out. If folks, if you, if you can pre-test with folks and ask them, hey, were any of these words confusing? Any of these questions confusing? Could you tell me what didn't make sense to you? That can help you figure out that you're, make sure that you're using the sort of um, native language of the folks that you're trying to survey. So this question, explain what, you, what gratified you about your participation in our workshop and the possible outcomes that could produce beneficial results for those within your field or industry. It's complicated. The words might not be something that anyone would actually say that was, was taking your workshop. Um, so we want to be very clear and we want to be using the language that somebody in your, in your group would use. This is also incidentally why it's so difficult to do research across international groups because translations are very difficult to get clear. Um, there's ways that people do it, but it's, it's challenging. Um, and then finally, the use of absolutes. I always enjoy attending these workshops. Well, first of all, what's, what are these workshops, right? It's not very clear. But then also, I do enjoy attending these workshops, but I don't, not always. There was that one day when I had a stomach pain and it wasn't that great, right? So then I would answer in false and the data wouldn't be useful for you because you actually wouldn't get what you might want to get out of it, which is, does she like going to these workshops, right? So again, considering the absolutes, the words to consider here are things like always, never, I even, I, 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 good and bad, um, those kinds of words, when, when you're saying something really absolutely, you, you have to be very careful about um, what, you're, what data you're getting out of it, okay? Other concerns with surveys, um, the flow of questions that you're asking. Uh, one, of the, one of the, if you are ever asking the question, questions that are more <coughs> sensitive, things like, um, uh, if you're asking somebody their salary, for instance, or if you're asking background, their, sometimes their marital background, that kind of thing, those are almost always at the end of surveys because you have established trust with the person. Um, so what you want to do is establish trust. In fact, some researchers will suggest that the first question is a throwaway question because you're just trying to get them engaged. The last, re the last questions are the ones where if they've stuck it out that long, they're going to finish it and they're going to tell you the truth, more likely anyway. Um, so consider the flow of those questions. Make some easier questions up front to sort of hook folks in. Um, also consider with the flow of questions that sometimes um, that if you if you do a lot of short short questions, so things like multiple choice, 
before you do long answer questions, the answers tend to be shorter in the long answer questions. Does that make sense? So if folks go through and they have, uh, have done short answer questions and then you want them to do long narratives, they won't do very long narratives. If you want them to do long narratives, you have to start with long narratives, right? Long typing things. So that's, that's all about the flow in terms of uh, creating research. Formatting, this is somewhat changed now, which I'm delighted by with so many, with Google Forms and you know, SurveyMonkey and things like that. Um, there's a lot of programs out there that will create um, the format for you. But I would just suggest that the formatting of your questions is something to pay attention to. Um, I've seen, I can't tell you how many times, you've probably done this too, you're, you're filling out a form that's on a piece of paper and you can't tell where the bubble goes, which one the bubble belongs to because they're all in the row. It means that you're gonna get incorrect responses if people are confused with where they check. So, uh, the length of surveys, um, you want to make them as short as possible. Sometimes it's important to do them for, they have to be longer. And so in those cases, being very clear about how long it typically takes um, and possibly offering some sort of return or compensation or a thank you at least to say thank you for filling this out. Be very careful about incomplete or vague answers. So if you're, especially if you're doing multiple choice questions, um, there are one of, the, one of the easiest things to do is to not have an option or just put other and say, you know, fill this out. Those, those are uh, challenging to, to, to answer. And you'll also get a lot of folks, if you don't know the multiple choice if you, and you put an other there and you say, well, we'll just catch the rest of them, it, then you have to code all of the others, right? You have to figure out what to do with all of that. So figuring out that ahead of time can, can make a difference. And then the order of the answers as well, um, just make sure that it makes sense, the order that they're in. So again, this is my, this is my takeaway. Will the data co you collect be useful to you? And if so, how? How are you going to use the data that you collect? How is this going to be beneficial for you? Because I think working backwards from that can be very beneficial in asking more robust questions and to make sure that the surveys and the things that you create actually do what you want them to do. Okay, so now I'm going to talk briefly about a case study, which is the Software Carpentry Foundation. Um, this is a, um, those of you who've noticed, my last name is Duckles. My brother is the executive director, so this is a fair warning that this is the bias that comes there. He strong-armed me into doing this research, so <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's why this is uh, there. But um, it was a fascinating uh, project, and I really enjoyed working on it. So our research question was, what is the value of the Software Carpentry Foundation to the volunteers who teach the courses? Um, and this means not the folks who are taking the courses, but for the folks that go out and teach. And for those of you who don't know about what the Software Carpentry Foundation does, um, it, is a, um, it, it is a bunch of folks who are interested in teaching basic computing to scientists. Um, things like Bash, uh, Shell, basic scripting in R or Python, um, those kinds of things to scientists. And it's a two-day workshop um, that are taught by peers. So uh, other scientists, researchers, uh, grad students, that kind of thing. And so what we were surveying were all of those folks that really commit to going out to wherever to teach a two-day workshop to a bunch of people that they probably don't know very well. Um, why do they do it? What, what is the benefit to them? What do they get out of going and talking with a whole bunch of uh, people for two days and teaching them how the basics of like, click here, let's get this up and running, here's how you use GitHub, here's how you do these things. Um, well, so the format of what we did was, um, we did an online survey sent to all volunteers by the executive director, um, open-ended questions so that we could inductively determine unforeseen benefits, because we didn't know. We weren't sure what the benefits actually were. Um, we had some ideas, and certainly we had some folks who told us what they thought they were gonna, we were gonna find, but we did have some surprises, um, which was cool. Um, and then I coded those to find the themes in the, in the, um, in the uh, research. We made this very short to encourage a high level of response, and we did get that, which was about 46%, 47%. It was a 218 out of a 465 uh, pool of people at the time. Incidentally, that's actually gone up quite a bit. I think they're up to maybe 600 now of uh, folks. I should also say too, um, one of the really important parts of this was that they wanted to be able to use this data to write grants later on. And so having, 
stories, having um, uh, anecdotes, uh, having people talk a little bit about why this mattered to them was really useful to be able to write grants later. So that was their part of their interest. So the questions um, were, why did you become an instructor? How do you use the skills you teach in software carpentry, data carpentry, in your daily work? Um, I should also tell you, Data Carpentry is the sister organization of Software Carpentry, and they share a lot of the, of the instructors, instructor base. So we just lumped them together for the purposes of this. What is the benefit, personally and professionally, to you in being involved in Software Carpentry, Data Carpentry? What examples do you have of how the Software Carpentry, Data Carpentry community have benefited others, students, labs, university groups? What suggestions do you have for improvement? Now, I just told you a lot about questions and how to make them really great, and I would suggest that these are not the best questions I could come up with. That said, we did our best, um, and there's a number of reasons why we have some challenging questions, but that's another, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the findings that we had were that the key benefits were networking with a diverse community of scientists, that's why people were going out and doing this, learning how to teach, because the teacher training was really widely regarded, um, and then also the actual act of teaching the content, people who were teachers really enjoyed the process of doing that. What was surprising to find, and with this was very robust, a lot of people talked about this, is that the online materials were a huge asset to the organization. That they didn't, I mean, I, I think they knew that folks were using them, but they didn't realize how important they were both to recruiting people to come into the organization, um, because all of, their, all of their materials and all of the pedagogy is open source. Um, also that the, the teachers were sharing the information with others. They were sending links, they were talking about this with folks that needed to learn the basic skills. And that was, that was not something that they knew was happening. And finally, there was a lot of folks that were also using these materials in other settings, perhaps in workshops, workplaces. Um, actually, some folks talked about taking the materials and turn, you know, fitting them into other workshops that they were a part of. And this was, a, this was surprising to us because we just didn't know that folks were that committed to um, as I mentioned, the teacher training program was very positively regarded. One of the other surprises was how important the marketable skills were to the folks that were the teachers. This gave a path forward for software carpentry to think a little bit about what kinds of skills they're offering to people and how they can better sort of flag that those skills are, are useful for the, uh, the folks that were taking that. Really passionate instructor base. I mean, the language that folks were using, were using when talking about this was about um, how committed they were to uh, the, the underlying beliefs of the, uh, of the organization, how much they enjoyed doing this, how much they liked teaching and being able to teach. There was a lack of clarity about teacher effectiveness and student follow-up, um, which is being addressed right now, I think, because they're trying to redo some of the pre and post surveys. Um, but that's, a lot of the teachers wanted to know how they were effective. So again, similar to what you guys are all here for, the effectiveness is still a challenge. There were lots of ideas for improvement, but interestingly, very little agreement about what those changes should be. Um, and, and really, I, I was surprised by this. I sort of expected there would be a couple of strains that would really come out, but there was just no cohesion in terms of the kinds of things people were saying. It was very diverse, which is great because everybody was passionate, but there wasn't like, we have to do this. There was no real one direction for that. Um, I, by the end, I also uh, found pretty easily that the, the, the instructor base was very able to talk about the mission of the organization and passionately talk about it. Um, and so they, I, I sort of cobbled together through the language that people were using what the organizational mission was in um, the words that they used. Um, so certainly this has possible biases given that the highly engaged instructors, I just to sort of round out what we've talked about here, the highly engaged instructors are certainly the ones who responded to this, right? And that's what we have when, we, when we're social sciences that we the people who respond are the ones that are most engaged. Also, we did no demographic information on this, and so we have no idea how many men, women, we don't have that information. So we know it's biased for sure, but we don't know how, right? That said, the data that we got was important and useful for us and helped us understand the answers and frankly answered the questions that we were asking. So it was less important to us because we found the answers that we were looking for. Also, English language. Um, Folks that had English as a second language probably were less likely to respond to this because it was done in English, and since this is a worldwide organization, that's a concern. Also, time of day, given that this is an international organization, pressing go in one part of the world is going to be different in another part of the world. It is going to change response times. So we don't really know what kind of impact that had or, or if at all. Um, I would also say, uh, you know, we got carried away and threw some more things into some of those questions. 
questions, and so that's when I, when I mentioned that double barrel questions are not great, uh, we, we, we did it anyway. If I were to change it, I would, I would separate out some of the questions, especially personal and professional. People had th different things to talk about in terms of um, their gains from that. And I would reword the question that we had where we were talking about um, trying to get, we were trying to solicit um, stories or anecdotes that people had to say. And we did end up getting them, so um, the data ended up turning being what we wanted, but I would, I would change the wording of that question, certainly. Um, yeah. I would say also just in terms of generally for doing uh, this kind of research, it is always good, even if you're doing just a whole bunch of multiple choice questions, to put at the end of anything a, um, an open response question. Because you would be surprised what people say, and sometimes what they say is, the link is broken on question number <laughs> which you really need to know, but you wouldn't know if you didn't put that in there. So I strongly recommend, is there anything else you want to put? Is there anything else you want to say at the end of every survey? Because you'd be surprised at what kinds of information that you can find and get from that. Um, okay. So my final thoughts, and then I will stop talking so much. Thank you for your listening to me uh, ramble on and on. But first, consider your assumptions. This is just key about this. Consider the assumptions that are in your questions. Consider the assumptions in the answers that you're asking. You might want to make the assumptions. It's okay. I mean, if they're in a work workshop, you can ask them about the workshop. But just be clear about what the assumptions you are making and, and, and be uh, thoughtful about it. Um, consider only collecting the data that you need. Um, I can't tell you. I love surveys, so I answer every survey that I can get to. And I can't tell you how many times I'm like, really, do you need to know that question? You don't. What are you going to do with that information, mm -hmm. right? So I, I just, I really encourage you to think about what is it that you need out of this and to not ask more questions than that. We get really excited as researchers because we want to have all of the information. But if you're not going to use it, then it's going to waste both your time and their time and you're going to have a bunch of data that you don't need, okay? Um, that said, if you really do need the information, go ahead and ask it, right? It's important. But make sure that you ask what, what, what is important to ask. Pre-testing is so important. Pre-testing gives you so much information. I, I would suggest that the questions, problems that I had, I would have figured those out if I had pre-tested it. We were moving too quickly, I didn't pre-test it. Um, so I definitely suggest get a couple of people that you know who you can just hand a survey off to and then have them tell you what's wrong with it. Um, but getting it out of your head and into somebody else's hands is gonna make a big difference. Um, experiment to determine the best practices for your population. So I know we all wanna do this right the first time, but we may not be able to, and sometimes you may need a couple of times to figure out what is it that's going to, what, how are people going to respond best to your surveys. If you're worried about response rates, what are the best times of day? Try a couple of different times. Maybe divide your population into A and B and do A-B testing on that, right? Um, figure out ways to kind of uh, experiment with the things that, that you need to get better at. Um, if it's the language, if it's the, if it's the response rate, if it's anything like that. Um, you're going to need to be the person who understands your own population best because nobody else is going to understand your population. You can read all the books that you want about survey research and it's not going to tell you how to survey the people that you know better than they do. Okay? So it may be that Monday morning is like the perfect time to send a survey to people in your population or it may be that Friday afternoon is the best one. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but, but you need to find that out. Okay? Um, and then again, just because I harp on it, the open response question, I can't, I can't tell you enough how many times that has given you in, me information that I didn't know I needed. Um, so I just, I just encourage you to, even if you're doing something that's short, to always have a question that allows people to say whatever they want to say. And that is what I've got here. So um, I'm very happy to answer questions or talk about whatever. I think we're pretty close to time, so. Good.
Which of these if these values is important? It might not be. Exactly. But I, I guess I'm trying to I was trying to illustrate the sense of biases in there oh, okay. with the, the data that I got. So by by trying to be reflective about what biases are in that, that data that I collected, one of them is that there's probably some sort of bias demographically. But I don't know what it is because we didn't collect that data. So I couldn't tell you if we have more men versus more women versus the general population. I can't I can't give you that information because I don't know. So I'm going to guess it's probably biased in some manner. My best guess is that it's biased towards people who are highly involved in software carpentry, right? Um, who are more likely to respond to the, to the question. Um, but I don't have that answer. So it's it's not, that I'm not saying that, I'm actually not saying that it, it negatively influences my data, but I'm telling you that it definitely, it, it definitely is, the sample is biased. Gift certificate or something like that to try and get a sense for why they didn't 